<laughs> okay, so European makeover or extreme makeover European country edition <laughs> Italy. <laughs> All right. So, why didn't Italy already exist? Before you can talk about the unification of a country, you have to know why it hasn't already unified because we have a whole bunch of other countries that exist, Italy doesn't. Well, Italy has a real lack of nationalism. People see themselves as Sicilians. Or as Venetians, or Venetians, or Romans, or Florentians, or um, Milanese. They don't see themselves as Italian. They don't have that concept of something greater than what their local uh, monarchy is. Then there's a lot of opposition to the idea of a united Italy. Austria, in particular, does not want to see a united Italy on its southern border. Um, right now, those small monarchies are relatively weak. They can be pushed around. They can be manipulated. You get what you want out of them if you're big, strong Austria. And to have a united nation that would be able to stand against them is not appealing. So Austria interferes with any sorts of unification moves whenever they can. And then everybody needs a George Washington or a Marquis de Lafayette. Um, they need a leader of some sort. And one just hasn't emerged in Italy. Until... Giuseppe Mazzini, handsome fellow, looks pretty stressed out to me. Um, he comes up with, after having gotten in trouble in northern Italy, in Sardinia where he was hanging out, he goes into exile. He's sitting in Marseille, France, just across the border. Comes up with this idea and forms an organization aimed at establishing a sense of Italian nationalism. The organization is called Young Italy. Um, it's a secret group with the goal of eventually uniting all of these small principalities and monarchies into a united Italy. The secret gets out, as secrets often do. It's only a secret as long as you're the only one who knows it, right? And um, the local government puts the organization down harshly. Um, lots of people are rounded up. Twelve men are summarily executed. Mazzini himself is tried in absentia and sentenced to death. So if he gets found in Italy, they're going to kill him. Okay. Um, he will eventually go back to Italy uh, several times, um, but he won't be the one who actually unites Italy. Mazzini is still important, though, because the idea of young Italy spread to, whoops, spread to other nations that had similar ideas. That's where we get young Europe from. Um, other nations that had not unified, but were beginning to get kind of nationalist ideas. Young Germany comes out of this. Young Poland. Young Switzerland. Switzerland wasn't even a nation at this point in time. Mazzini also, through his organization and the way that it was stomped out, gives us what he refers to as the blood of martyrs. A lot of times people need some motivation to really get moving. The idea of a united Italy is maybe a little appealing, but yeah, you know. Sometimes you're not afraid enough of something to do anything about it. Oh look, there's a spider over there. Somebody go kill it. Nobody goes to kill it. Oh, God, there's a spider right here. Somebody come kill it. Come kill it now. The danger is more immediate to you, right? Had global terrorism been a problem in the world before the attacks in New York and Washington, D.C. in 2001? Absolutely. There was an attack in the London subway. There was an attack in a German shopping center. There was an attack on a London bus. There were attacks at embassies all over the world. And yet, what led us to start our war on terrorism? What happened to us directly in New York and at the Pentagon, the shedding of the blood 
of martyrs, something to really spur you to action. Okay. So that helps us come to answer our question, why now? If all of these factors existed, we haven't had a united Italy, Mazzini comes in, his organization gets squashed, so why now does the creation of an Italian state begin to actually happen? Well, blood inspires. As awful as it is, we can point to that and say we have to avenge that or that can't be in vain. It's a reason. A failed revolution will often draw people's attention, but a failed bloody revolution commands respect and demands action on its behalf. It's just the way we are. For some reason, it occurred to a bunch of these Italians that they were living in the land of the former Roman Empire, the biggest, most powerful empire that had been. And my gosh, why don't we revive that glory? We're here. We're descended by blood. How can we not? Gee, it's such a shame to let that just all drift away. Maybe we could have a new Roman Empire. And then one of the greatest motivators of men always is God is a good guess, but money, 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 money. Or in this instance, um, lira, lira, lira. Okay. If you are unified, it will make industrializing easier because you can share your resources. You'll be able to work out stronger trade agreements. Money equals power. A united Italy will be more powerful, thus more money, thus more powerful, thus more money, thus more powerful, blah, 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 blah. Right? Okay, so time to meet our major players. First up. Victor Emmanuel II, King of Sardinia Piedmont, or Piedmont Sardinia. Kind of go back and forth. Some historians prefer to call them uh, Sardinia Piedmont. Piedmont Sardinia is the one I'm more familiar with, what I've always heard it called, but there are sources on both sides. Kind of depends on where the historian was from. Was he from Piedmont or Sardinia? This is him in 1848, right after he'd taken the throne of Piedmont, Sardinia. Our next fella is Camilo Cavour. Very early in the days of photography here. Okay, he will be the prime minister of Piedmont, Sardinia. Camilo Cavour, I don't know why his name didn't show up there. Uh, C-A-M-I-L-L-O-C-A-V-O-U-R. It's probably going to show up later in the wrong spot. Okay, and then our final, final actor here is... Giuseppe Garibaldi. He will be a major leader in southern Italy. He's a nationalist. Can't get his name to come up either. Great. Giuseppe Garibaldi. G-A-R-I-B-A-L-D-I. -I. These three guys together will, will create Italy. These three guys together create Italy. And each will play a unique and very significant role. So Victor Emmanuel II is a brand new king. Um, his great-great-grandmother was Maria Theresa of Austria. 
guys are all related, one way or another. He took the. F <laughs> he took the throne when his father abdicated after a tremendous loss to Austria. His father was just so embarrassed he couldn't go on ruling Piedmont Sardinia anymore. And he's like, I, I gotta go. It's all yours. So, in 1849, here he is, newly crowned. He immediately works out a treaty with the Austrians, and he suppresses a rebellion in Genoa. Why do you know the name Genoa? That's where Christopher Columbus was from. Very good. Okay. Um, and then it won't be long before Victor Emmanuel II becomes associated with the Risorgimento. The Risorgimento is the name given to this Italian unification movement. Yes, it's a big foreign word. You have to know it. By the way, for ease of hand cramping, Victor Emmanuel II can very easily be abbreviated V-E-2, -E right? Piedmont Sardinia, P-S, okay? Risorgimento, Risorge, you know, or write it out. It's another good way to make sure you know it. Okay. So Camilo Cavour comes in um, when he is made Prime Minister of Piedmont Sardinia uh, by Victor Emmanuel in 1852. And this is a picture of him as Prime Minister of Piedmont Sardinia. Um, he was not a politician by trade. His schooling was in engineering. He had um, been an engineer, he'd fought in some wars with the Austrians, he had then been elected to the small little representative government in Piedmont, Sardinia, and kind of found a little bit of a voice there. He was a citizen farmer at this point in time. He was the first to introduce chemical fertilizers into Italy. So he was very progressive and liberal in that respect. But politically, he's very conservative. He's a monarchist. He likes the idea of having his king and wants his king to be in place and be powerful. So, um, Victor Emmanuel appoints him as prime minister in 1852, even though about the only thing that they have in common is that they both believe in Victor Emmanuel as king. Beyond that, they don't really like each other, they don't get along very well. But they worked well together because they were two sides of the same coin a liberal, a very conservative, and so they could work it out. Cavour believes in real politic. He, he ascribes to Bismarck's political beliefs in that practical goals achieved realistically. Do what it takes to get it done. And he understands that money is power. And so once he becomes... Prime Minister, he focuses on strengthening the economy of Piedmont Sardinia. He wants to improve the agriculture, get more people to use these chemical fertilizers. They don't have more land, so they need to get more out of their land. They've already got some rail lines in Piedmont Sardinia. He focuses on developing more, expanding those. And once they are expanded, using them for trade. The more we can trade, the more we can produce, the more wealthy we are. Wealth equals power. Because he and Victor Emmanuel, by this point, have one shared goal. Acquire adjacent territories in the process of strengthening Piedmont Sardinia. And maybe, if it all works out, <laughs> unifying Italy. And then along comes the Crimean War. mid-1850s. Crimean War is a war where Russia invaded the Ottoman Empire. What are they looking for? Same thing they've been looking for for a long time. A warm water port, absolutely. 
Well, Russia was equal in power to France and England. And if Russia got the Ottoman Empire, then Russia would be stronger than Britain or France. And remember, clear back to 1815, the Congress of Vienna, Clemens von Metternich, what was the goal? Balance of power. And if we let Russia defeat the Ottomans, there goes the balance of power. So France and England, who love each other, right? Yeah. They grit their teeth and they agree to work together to keep Russia from conquering the Ottomans to maintain the balance of power. Well, Cavour and Victor Emmanuel jump in on the side of the Western nations, fighting against Russia to preserve uh, the Ottomans. Ultimately, Russia isn't going to win here. This painting, what you're looking at, is just one small detail taken out of a massive panoramic painting, hundreds of feet long. This portion illustrates the siege of Sevastopol, um, a city in the Crimea. Crimea. It's painted in 1904. Um, incredible photorealism detail going on here. Um, unbelievable painting. You should, you should check it out online. You can zoom in and look at everything that's going on. It's really cool. Um, what does Piedmont Sardinia get out of joining with the Western nations? The alliance, the connections, the friendships. Um, they get a little technology. They get to rub shoulders. They get to play with the big boys. And they, too, don't really want Russia to get more powerful. Okay? Crimean War is over. And Italy looks like this in 1858. In the green, you've got Sardinia, okay, here in the island. This is the island of Sardinia. And then this is the Piedmont region. So you have Piedmont, Sardinia, okay. That's where Victor Emmanuel II is from, okay. In the yellow, you have Lombardy and Venetia. Venice sits right here on the coast. Very, very tr uh, powerful trading regions. Okay. In the orange, um, Parma, Modena, Tuscany, most famous Tuscan city you probably know, Florence. Um, Pisa is also up here, their, their, their tower, their toppling tower. Okay. Uh, seven, the Papal States, where the Pope controls. Uh, nine, you might recognize as San Marino. That little tiny duchy is going to stay independent through all of this. Okay. Uh, down here at the bottom, eight, is the kingdom of the two Sicilies. Uh, most powerful city you would know down here would be Naples. Um, Pompeii is also down here. And then, of course, the island of Sicily. So in 1858, all Victor Emmanuel controls is the green. Okay. Uh, by the way, 10 is Monaco. Um, this is hardly a unified Italy, right? Hardly a unified Italy. Well, Cavour is going to sign a secret agreement with Napoleon III. He's going to get a little help from France. France promises to help them out if Austria should go to war with them. What would make Austria go to war with Piedmont Sardinia? The answer to that is if Piedmont Sardinia caused any problem with Lombardy or Lombardy, Lombardy. Well, guess what Cavour does? Remember, he believes in Bismarck's way of thinking, so what does Cavour do? He provokes a war with Lombardy, which gets Austria into it, which then triggers the secret agreement with France. And so with France backing him up, now, all of a sudden, Victor Emmanuel is king of Piedmont, Sardinia, and Lombardy. Once that happens, then he's able, under his own power, to take out these orange countries. And now, he's got a good chunk of northern Italy here, right? Pretty good. At about the same time, down here in the south, a fellow by the name of Giuseppe Garibaldi 
Remember him? The one in the cool hat, the nifty poncho, right? He has a band of followers called the Red Shirts. He's got them fighting and working to unify southern Italy. He actually started out up here. He sails down south and mounts a campaign to conquer the kingdom of the two Sicilies. And he does it. He does it. Now, Camilo Cavour had assisted him. Now, Cavour didn't actually think that Garibaldi would carry it off. Didn't think he'd do it. But what he thought is that Garibaldi would weaken these guys down here so that he and Victor Emmanuel could go down and conquer them, right? Give a little financial support. Let the other guy do the hard fighting, soften him up, and then you go in and finish him off. Well, Bowie... Garibaldi conquers the kingdom of the two Sicilies. And Cavour is sitting at home, his knees is shaking, knocking, uh-oh, now I've got two Italys. I have a northern Italy and a southern Italy, and that's not what I wanted. And then Garibaldi does the coolest, most unexpected thing. It's like, here you go. And he hands over the kingdom of the two Sicilies to King Victor Emmanuel, because... Garibaldi wanted Italian unification. He didn't want division, so he just hands them over. At that point, Victor Emmanuel II is crowned the first king of Italy. Now there's a bit of illogic going on here. Victor Emmanuel II is the first king of Italy. What do we know about the numbers on kings? The first dude with that name... It's the first number, right? Has there ever been another king of Italy? No. So how can Victor Emmanuel II be the first? Right? He may have been the second Victor Emmanuel to rule Piedmont, Sardinia, but he's not the second Victor Emmanuel to rule Italy. He chose not to take the renumber, probably because his shirts and sheets and stuff were all monogrammed already. <laughs> He just, it was a deliberate choice that he chose not to become Victor Emmanuel I of Italy. He just stayed Victor Emmanuel II. Okay? So sort of clear up any potential confusion if you were to think about it. So we have a united Italy then, right? What's wrong? Oops. Oh, the Pope dude. Right, right, right. Um, well, there's a pretty good reason why Victor Emmanuel doesn't also control the Papal States. The Pope is under the protection of the French. And while the French were perfectly willing to help weaken the Austrians, they have no interest in weakening the Pope because the French are very Catholic. By the way, Victor Emmanuel II, also very Catholic. In fact, the former king of the Kingdom of the Two Sicilies had pledged his allegiance to the Pope. And when Victor Emmanuel accepted that newly conquered territory, the Pope excommunicated him. Said, you can't be the king of that territory. I always crown the king of that territory. The Pope, is cre count the Pope has crowned the king of Sicily since about 1200. And he's like, I didn't put that crown on your head. You can't take that crown. Uh-uh. And, by the way, because I said you can't and you're doing it anyway, you're out. Straight to hell with you. Well, it looks like we're going to have a united but divided Italy. Because France isn't about to walk away from the Pope. Unless they get really distracted by something else way more important at home. Like, oh, for instance, an invasion by a hugely aggressive neighbor to their northeast that threatens the very well-being of their entire nation. Something like the, um, oh, I don't know, the Franco-Prussian War of 1870? Yeah, Napoleon gets drawn into that little uh, 
affair and is like, ah, a uh, big army, way powerful, not prepared, uh, calls the troops home from Rome to help him defend France against the Prussians. And Victor Emmanuel's like, what? What's that I see? Is that the French sailing away home? <laughs> Rubs hands, eagle cackle, charge! <laughs> and he takes the Papal States with very little difficulty. And so in 1870, we have a truly united France. Now the Pope, guys, is going to have his nose seriously out of joint over this whole Risorgimento in Italy thing. The Pope benefited politically from having a divided Italy because he could charge, wink, wink, all of these different monarchs and princes for an endorsement of their crown. And from the Pope, an endorsement of your crown comes when he crowns you, right? And he doesn't really charge for that fee. How's that work? Well, because you're a good Catholic monarch, you're so honored by the Pope granting you your crown that you want to show your fealty to the Pope. And so you give donations of, um, you sign away the taxes to a chunk of your land, or you drop huge amounts of, of wealth on him, or you give him a major castle in your territory, all kinds of stuff, right? Well, when there's one king of Italy and the Pope lives in territory controlled by him, Pope's lost a lot of power because he's now lost a lot of wealth as well. Wealth is power. Land is wealth. No land. Uh-oh. The Pope is going to be incredibly ticked until the 1930s when Mussolini comes to power in Italy and he will write one seriously large check to the Pope to pay compensation for the loss of all of this land to the Pope. A huge check. Um, and he grants sovereignty to the Vatican City State as well. Um, so, 1870, the Franco-Prussian War, which helped to spur the unification of Germany, actually brings about the final unification of Italy. I love how history just locks together that the Franco-Prussian War brought about final Italian unification. Now, Italy is not all perfect. Up here to the north, this was a trading region. Lots of wealth, big cities. Trade bring, brings cities. In the south, Naples is pretty much it. There's not a lot of trade. These are farmers. They're poor. They don't have cities. And so you've really got two varying economic uh, standpoints to come from. You've got this spine of mountains that runs the length of the country. And so industrialization is going to start coming to Italy after the Risorgimento, but it's going to be slow. And still today in Italy, when you go, there is a, a palpable feel that life is different in northern Italy than it is in southern Italy. The further south you go, the more laid back, the more casual, the more easygoing. On the streets or on the canals of Venice or on the streets of Florence, people walk briskly. They're all in a hurry. They all have somewhere to go. And what I was struck by during my most recent visit there, in northern Italy, they all have watches and their phones are out all the time and they're just going, they're talking, they're doing. In southern Italy, they're sitting on a bench somewhere. They're reading a book. They stroll. They don't have watches on. Just walking down the street, there's no watches on them in southern Italy. It's kind of cool. It's just a totally different way of life. And it goes back all that way to how it's always been. Questions? No? Really? I did it that well? It's always a question. Okay, well then, thank you very much. Oh, a question! Do we, do we have to have it in years? 
Do you have to know any of the years? You should know um, 1870 for sure. Um, when we do the Crimean War, we'll do it when we do Russia in Section 5, and you'll have to know it then, but no, not right now. 1870. Anything else? All righty. Yay, us.